the Vice President of State Government Affairs for Charter Communications, who will be introducing the City Council speaker today. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Is everyone filled up for lunch? I feel like I uh, am on election day at the senior center. We've <laughs> <laughs> all been there, right? <laughs> um, well, good afternoon. My name is Roger Capel. I'm the Vice President of State Government Affairs uh, for Charter Spectrum. It's a pleasure to be with you all. Uh, I'd like to thank the city and state uh, for putting this day together and to the Museum of Jewish, Jewish Heritage for hosting us uh, this day and this wonderful event uh, during the holiday season. Uh, Charter has been a committed partner uh, in efforts to strengthen community access to the internet, expand broadband infrastructure, as well as to work to improve service daily uh, for better overall customer experience. Since the pandemic, Charter has worked to provide broadband service to customers no matter where they live or how much money they make. So my vantage point is the largest operator in this arena in the city. Uh, adoption poses the most significant obstacle to connecting households uh, and then uh, broadband infrastructure uh, as well uh, is not the issue that we believe because the challenges that we face. Uh, but we do believe that tackling individual affordability through socialized service administration or wealth service opportunities is the fastest and most cost effective way to bring sustainable broadband solutions into homes. Charter has invested in these types of agreements uh, we've seen this work uh, in our support um, at the uh, local level, uh, working with Do It uh, and the Department of Homeless Services. Uh, we helped to facilitate firing at 67 uh, home, uh, housing and homeless shelters um, with children who are in need of that connectivity. Uh, we are currently in contract uh, uh, to do about two more of those uh, across our footprint, uh, which has uh, provided almost 3,000 apartments and 64 completed buildings wired in homeless shelters. So we're proud of that work and proud of working with the city uh, moving forward in that area. Uh, we look forward to working with, with all of you who are going into the council and those who are already there uh, to partner in the efforts to close the digital divide. We have the infrastructure and experience uh, and the shovel ready ability, we think, to make any meaningful impact to work with this council. Charter has also made investments in communities across the city. We have 40 internet learning labs and public libraries, nonprofit centers, and community spaces like the Hispanic Federation and National Action Network Helps with Justice. Uh, we've partnered with Empowerment Learning uh, to help students and their families improve digital literacy by providing grants for computers, learning services, and guided workshops. And we have provided some funding for groups like the NACP, the Empire State Pride Agenda, the Make the Road. Chinese American Planning Council and many others. Um, we saw 2021 uh, our city transform politically into a short period of time following the municipal elections of this past year. Term limits resulted in 35 of the 51 seats turning over in addition to open seats for mayor, borough president, and city controller. We saw over 250 candidates in the run for office in 2021. Some of these council races have 10 candidates in, in, a, in a race. Uh, so your presence here today uh, for the members who are here is both a blessing and a salute to the hard work you all made to represent your communities across the city. Uh, I'm in the fun position of being able to welcome the panel immediately following uh, lunch, but no matter we are having an exciting discussion coming up about the importance of the city council speaker uh, and the candidates who are trying to obtain that role. Um, it is my honor to introduce two moderators for discussion today both who are savvy experience and in the know professionals. First is India Sneed, an attorney with the renowned firm of Greenberg Carr. Is, is India here? Oh, India. India plus one. India's practice is focused on government relations. She has a diverse background including trial practice, election law practice, minority and women business, enterprise certification, guidance, policy, and legislation development, government relations, and community engagement. And she's a former council staffer, most important, like Mr. And next is Ken Fisher. In the country, Ken is a deep knowledge of New York City and state issues. Ken practices concentrating on the public realm of the metropolitan area. 
His experience includes real estate development, zoning and land use, administrative and regulatory law, government contracting litigation and investigations, and most importantly, he's a former council member. Mm -hmm. In the intent, we will moderate the panel that includes council members Adrian Adams, Diana Ayala, Justin Brennan, Francisco Moya, Keith Powers, Carlina Rivera, uh, and council member elect Gail Brewer, all folks who have worked in the past with and think very highly of and wish you all the best. I don't have to tell you because you were here all day long about the job of the city council as being a 24 by 7 assignment, uh, but the role is probably in speaker debt 10 times more. Um, having worked for a speaker in my previous life in government, I know how difficult the role is and the challenges that come with that position. Next to the mayor, the speaker's probably the most visible and talked about influential position in city government. Uh, and I'll let this panel obviously uh, enlighten us, but I know it's going to be a long, fact filled day. City Council debate is about an hour, so may as well be, uh, it's going to be one of the more important things of our, I think, our conversation this today. But I urge you all to listen, uh, to learn, and hear from India and Ken about uh, what they have to say. As we close 2021, I want to wish you all a very, very uh, peaceful and happy uh, holiday season. Uh, and I look forward to working with all of you uh, coming into office and those who are still here. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you. Much I haven't tweeted out about myself 
Uh, yeah, um, I love Twizzlers. Um, um, well, I mean, I, I played in a punk rock band for about 15 years. I never dreamt of being in politics. I used to have posters of Ram the Ramones and ACDC on my wall, not JFK. Um, I think most people know that. I'm blind in one eye as of yesterday. That's exciting. Um, what are you going to do? Um, I think this. My left eye. I have, I have a, something called keratoconus, um, and I learned yesterday that the only way I can fix it is if I get uh, a cornea transplant in my left eye, so uh, that's, that's new and exciting. Um, I am Gail Brewer, and I appreciate that Justin was so honest to talk about it, because my husband has also eye challenges, so the issue of health care is always first and foremost for all of us. And, Good luck with that, Justin. I mean that. Really. Um, uh, I'm a very open book also. I would say that the one issue, uh, similar perhaps to others, is I've had 35 foster care kids. So when people say, you know, have you been to Rikers? Yes. Have you been to court in the middle of the night? Yes. Have you seen what it is when people return from uh, some kind of incarceration? And how do you make sure that they don't fall back in the same path? Or how do you deal with drug abuse? Or how do you deal with parents who are not helpful with their children. Um, in my case, I picked them up from the hospitals during the crack hits because the parents didn't. So, um, and I think that's what's unusual about me is that at this point, my skin is so damn thick from these challenges that I can handle uh, other kinds of challenges because I always remember during those days that um, I was loved to have sent half of them to the Bloomberg uh, house so that he could have dealt more with uh, public safety and issues regarding criminal justice, because these kids need a chance, and that's what you learn over and over again. Thank you. So, uh, I don't think many people know this, but I'm a huge FC Barcelona fan. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows this, it's something that, you know, has uh, been a well-kept secret for many, many years. The love for soccer, the city and the team. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, I think it's already gotten leaked out that I used to be a professional DJ at some of the biggest clubs in New York City way back when. Uh, but uh, I love music, I love vinyl, I love uh, playing for folks. Uh, I've secretly, prior to COVID, would sneak into certain clubs, play for about an hour or so and then leave. Nobody knew that uh, council member Francisco Moya was DJing at some of these clubs um, just because uh, I love uh, music and uh, really uh, it's been a passion of mine for, for many years. Thank you. Hey guys, uh, I will, first of all, I'm shocked to find out you are a Barcelona fan, my friend. Uh, nice to see everyone. So we're doing music, it sounds like, and I will tell you, this is, I don't think a lot of people know this, but before, and this is about somebody on the stage here, before I met Justin Brownman, I probably saw his band play 25 times. And I met my best friend in college because he was wearing a shirt of Justin's band. That was a true story. I was the only guy who went to his show title, though. Hello. There we go. Real revelations today. Um, so, hi everyone, I'm Carlina. Uh, for those of you maybe who haven't heard, I guess I'm a proud turtle mom. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I've had a turtle for 31 years, and I bought him in one of those like pet stores where like you go to the left, you could get a pet, and you go to the right, and you could buy a bicycle. That's like an old school shared lease LES thing. Um, but I guess also I, I played basketball for a really long time, for those that don't know. I love sports, maybe it adds to my competitive spirit, but uh, that also means I go hard in the paint and I crash the boards. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Thank you. I, Carlina, I bought a rabbit at that same pet store. <laughs> I want to see the receipt. I'm serious! <laughs> they, sold, they sold like animals and in the back you could buy a scooter. That's what I just said. Yeah, no, I know, but that's why I'm here. So, we're, we're not doing issues, so no animal positions. So. I, I do want to make a public service announcement for all of the, the registered lobbyists here. Uh, some of you may know New York Law School, as we speak, is having a, a legal education class on uh, lobbying compliance for land use. 
and the deputy director of Jacob, according to a text I just got, was hearing about Mueller for the first time. So if you ever wondered why they take some of the positions they do, yes, they really don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> are directed at particular council members. We'll also have a hand raising session. Um, when you all do answer, we do ask that you keep it at one minute. Um, it's gonna be very uncomfortable if I have to say, council member, you're going beyond your time. So please don't make me do that, okay? Um, and if you do specifically call out another council member, they will have one minute for some sort of retort. So, Ken, did you have another question that you wanted? Okay, so here we go, Can council member Brandon. You are in the hot seat. Do you support increasing the amount of money designated for participatory budgeting? Absolutely. I think not only do we have to increase the money, uh, you mean the pot that, that we, we, we let the community vote on? Well, actually the infrastructure. That's oh yeah, well that's, I mean I think that might be even more important. I think giving, um, PB is, is a great program. Um, it's something I promised to do in my campaign because the, the president, my predecessor did it and then we did it. Fortunately, COVID, we, we haven't been able to do it. I think it's been great. I think the biggest challenge is making sure that the members have the support they need to run a great PB campaign. Because it's a great organizing tool. It's a great way to demystify government and how much stuff costs for your constituents. But you need, it's hard to, you only if you have a small staff, another reason why we have to increase our staff budget, but if you have a small staff, to, to uh, put two staffers only doing PB is very hard and you're also doing constituent cases. So I'm all for increasing the budget, but especially for the infrastructure. Thank you. Adam Munson. So, Council Member Adams, despite everybody's best efforts, it's impossible to be in more than one place at a, at a time. And all of you have district responsibilities, you've got ceremonial responsibilities, and then you have your responsibilities to the council. What do you think is the, the optimum number of committees that a council member should be on? Is it, is it the more the better, or is it a smaller number so you can concentrate? What do you think? Thank you for the question, Ken. You're, you're asking that question to someone that was appointed to seven no, committees um, as a brand new council member, and I take it as a compliment and a, and a curse at the same time, uh, thanks to our, uh, our present speaker. I was a member of general welfare, of finance, BNT, I'll throw that in there as well. It's not a committee, but it is an appropriation on the council. Also, a member of rules, privileges, and the elections. Uh, also, uh, public safety, civil service and labor. Uh, I'm probably leaving something out, and it's only because there were seven no, uh, committees that, uh, that I t was totally committed to, still am committed to those. Is there a number? I think there should be because I think that seven committees is a tremendous responsibility for any council member that has to focus on a district, on legislation, and their work at City Hall as well. I feel that I was very effective, still am, still love what I do, wake up every day on purpose, with a purpose, serving every single committee that I've been committed to since day one on the City Council. There, well, okay, we can round it off. I would say five is comfortable, six would be maximum in my estimation. So this one is for Council Member Elect Brewer. Um, there have been some recent complaints of the council starting to age bills without any warning, possibly to keep opposition from organizing. In the interest of transparency, would you commit to a larger notice period, except in the case of a genuine emergency? Absolutely, yes. I think that the aging, which is, um, you know, you have to put it on the desk and you have to have enough time, not only for the members to read it and participate, but for the people and the advocates who have worked so hard to get that bill passed. I'm all about transparency. Um, there may be some budget or other uh, situations where there's a message of necessity, but I would opt most definitely for transparency and as much aging and public as possible. I would also change some of the, as you heard earlier, transparency in social media, so that it is also available on social media. 
So th this is a question for Councilmember Moyer, and I, I want to preface it by saying I'm not trying to pick a fight between you and the, and the speaker, so don't misunderstand this, but if, as, as you think about what it would be like and, and to sit in the chair that, that he occupies now, can you give us an example of something that you might have handled differently than he did? Uh, look, I, I, I think that what we're seeing now, and I'll give an example, um, with the rezonings that we're facing in the city of New York, uh, the member deference issue uh, is played a critical role. Um, for me, it was the blood center as the example of why it's important when we have uh, rezonings that are coming up that have a profound impact on the city of New York, and it's not just a spot rezoning, we really need to involve more of the members and the committees that are relevant here to speak out uh, about what they feel uh, is important there. Uh, I would never get into the rezonings that uh, there are spot rezonings of a local council member. They know what's best, but I think when we have projects that present themselves that have an economic uh, uh, health impacts uh, throughout the city, uh, that's where I feel that we have to move to a more democratic process uh, in approving those uh, land use issues. Councilmember Rivera, are you open to having the council modify or repeal term limits or put it on the ballot? Usually open to putting it on the ballot and letting voters decide. Um, right now, I think term limits are very appropriate, and I think to um, as been serving as well. I realize there's a lot of frustration. You're going to put forward projects that you're not actually going to get to cut the ribbon on. And that can feel a bit frustrating. But I think having a great relationship and, and understanding kind of your objective, which is to invest in communities. Those are the most successful, healthiest communities. And you have a speaker that will lead the way on supporting you in that. You will feel very, very successful after eight years or whatever is deemed appropriate. I'll be more willing to put it to the voters. Thank you. Councilmember Ayala, what's the one thing you've done as a council member up until this point that you think will have the most lasting impact? I hope my work around mental health and uh, your, your crisis, uh, because that's the most immediate to me, um, and it's an issue that is impacting you know, thousands of New Yorkers every single day. Um, and also, I would probably say maybe uh, our work around the Close Right Girls campaign. Okay. Council Member Powers, should the mayor elect weigh in on his preference for speaker or stay out of the council's business? Um, look, I agree with the uh, mayor elect's position, which is this is a vote of the colleagues of the members of the city council, and I think it's appropriate for him to have, you know, a, an opinion on it. But I think that we really this is a decision that we should make as people that are going to be working in that body, and we have to feel comfortable with who's going to be leading it. So I think it's up to the council members, and I think his position has been the appropriate one. So, so this is going to be a show of hands question. It's the question that many of you can hear this hear the answer on. And Indy and I drew straws, I lost. Um, so I'm going to ask by a show of hands. Yesterday, a number of progressive organizations demanded that you not accept or, or seek Republican support uh, in getting to your 26 votes. I think everybody knows if you have 26, you have 51. But to get to your 26. So please raise your hand if you will accept uh, or are seeking Republican support to get to 26. Thank you. So as a follow-up, will the minority leader be part of the budget negotiating committee? And if not, how will you account for their budget priorities in the negotiations? Maybe a quick answer down the line. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That would be a yes. Yep. Yes, I know they have been in the past, and uh, in my view, they should be in the future. Uh, look, I think that 
Uh, there's a reason why we have a democratic majority. Uh, my experience in Albany has always been that we conference the democratic side uh, without having to have Republicans in that process. Um, but there is a shared role that we have to have um, when the speaker uh, sits with the majority, minority leader, uh, to discuss uh, their priorities. Uh, I look at that as the model which I would take uh, going into uh, this year. Uh, yeah, my answer is yes. Steve Maddow is on BNT right now. And I think actually not only as a voice for the Republican caucus, but a voice for the thorough as well. I think it's been important. So um, I think it's appropriate to keep the minority leader on the field. Yes, I agree. I mean, we have to stay true to our values and who we are, I think, as a progressive, proactive, results-driven body. And I agree that Maddow was actually an asset on BNT and learning not just what it's like to live and work on Staten Island, the nuances of that borough, but also um, wanting to make sure that we actually look to you members as being experts in your own districts. So it will be a learning experience across the board. Council Member, uh, Council Member elect Miller again. How much loyalty do you expect from your body? Oh, loyalty is a funny word. I think it's two way because I think that the speaker has to be loyal to their members and not toxic and not twisting arms and, and you can be strong by being uh, transparent and clear and have relationships that are productive. And, and that's how, I, you know, 12 years in the city council, passed a lot of bills that way and similar as borough president. So uh, the answer to your question is, uh, it's a two-way street, you know, I believe in uh, you, sometimes you can get to consensus, or sometimes you say, this is what you know, I think is best for our city and for our city council. We want to work with the mayor, but we are number one, the legislative body. So I think the answer to your question is, it's not just, it's not loyalty, it's how we can work together to accomplish the agenda that New Yorkers are really, really anxious about us accomplishing. This is a question for Councilmember Powers. I don't know if any of you saw uh, an article that went online in the Times today by Michael uh, Kibbelman, their architecture uh, critic. Uh, it's about the, the, the big U in Lower Manhattan, but put aside the merits of the project. The fundamental thrust of the article is about how if you build trust with communities, um, you'll get more buy-in even for controversial things. And, and Keith, you had a lot of experience with that with the East Midtown uh, process. Um, what lessons did you learn from that that you think you could take to being the speaker and building trust with eight and a half million New Yorkers? Yeah, uh, great question. Uh, look, I think that in every land use application that we get that has any sort of controversial element of it, there's always a complaint that the application gets certified and starts moving and there has not been enough uh, feedback from the community at the very start. In fact, we don't even have a planning process that really incorporates in a proactive way what communities are asking for until a private application or a big public neighborhood rezoning shows up. So I think certainly there's opportunities and there's legislation in the city council that discusses a piece of this, but there's should be a process of planning that includes uh, people and everyday New Yorkers more proactively than it does right now. Um, in East Midtown, what we did, or I have inherited most of the projects, but uh, for President Brewer, my predecessor, uh, there was an end of Bloomberg uh, attempt to try to uh, upzone East Midtown with, to do uh, a lot of sort of modernization of Midtown, including the uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in transit infrastructure that comes alongside of that. That's how we got one Vanderbilt, that's how we're getting, we're getting a number of other projects. Uh, to their credit, uh, Borough President Brewer and Councilman Karanik did not let that be a last minute attempt by the Bloomberg administration. They pushed it into this administration, they got the committee at the table, they got a very, very su successful rezoning. And as we speak, we have probably also already approved five or six projects that are going to bring in about a billion dollars of subway improvements in the mid East Midtown, bring in east side access into Midtown and do a lot for uh, maintaining that as a commercial hub. So, I think we all can recognize that the community should be at the table, be part of the process. And I think in some of the reasons we have that are uh, coming through my district even now, we started a with, with the borough president, have started a process where you have to commit to the table a year or two years before that rezoning got certified. And, it, I think, and we made tremendous progress, we're not there, but we made tremendous progress to get the community more on board and to see their comments uh, reflected in the application. So I, I'll just end on this note because I think my time is up. Is, 
you know, we do, like, go back to what I said at the beginning, like, we have to have a process in place where communities don't feel like they're under attack when a rezoning comes. It was like on the Blood Center, other projects. We want to get these projects done. We want to create good jobs and economic activity in the city, and we want to reduce the tension when we do that, and that's one way to do it. Councilmember Rivera, as speaker, you have access to a number of tools, carrots and sticks, to whip your body in shape and gather votes. Can you tell us what some of your carrots and sticks are? Carrots and sticks. Well, I mean, you want to go into this with the vision of building a safer, more equitable, affordable city for every single New Yorker. And I think with carrots and sticks, like, I guess I wouldn't quite describe it like that, though I appreciate the question, is how do we get people to build consensus? It can be very, very difficult when, you know, maybe our ideologies aren't exactly aligned or it's a very broad political spectrum. I think the answer is, is communication and, and, and listening. I think everyone can get better at that, regardless of your profession and through adulthood. So I think if there's anything I've learned over the last four years, is that to continue to communicate, to be honest, that's how I would lead this administration, lead this body, which is with honesty and with integrity, and to make sure that we're constantly in communication talking about the issues that are important. I think we have to also make a list of priorities. And so, for example, if we're going to be more proactive about the budget, we'll discuss our priorities as a body, and then put that forward in a transparent, public-facing way at the top of the calendar year. So I think that's a way of letting people know that not only am I listening to you, but we have publicly committed to it. So this is for Councilmember Boyna. You know, building camaraderie and, and relationships among council members is, is not always easy to do because you're you're all committed to your own uh, being in your own districts. But it's an important role for the for the speaker to play. So. Other than having a soccer game at the summer retreat, uh, what ideas do you have to create opportunities for, for members to sort of interact on a social basis? Look, I, I think that the, the, the new members have been doing a tremendous job uh, so far in how they have gone to each other's events. Uh, the ability for them to like truly come together is something that we need to continue to replicate uh, in this body. Uh, look, I've built lifelong friendship with folks. Uh, in Albany, it was easier because we were all there, right? Uh, in the city, it's different because uh, you come in for the stated meeting or uh, you have a hearing, you immediately have to run back to your district. There's no real time for uh, the uh, folks to kind of get together. Uh, we have to start building uh, more of a structure that has uh, the ability to do some retreats and uh, dinners. Those are important, but for me, as speaker, it's also being able to go out to your districts, uh, sit with you. Uh, we've all done that, but it's the ability of really uh, getting to know one another. Uh, we always find out that we have uh, more commonalities than we do differences when we speak. Uh, and I think it's an important tool for us to be able to, one, understand uh, each other. Uh, we may have uh, different political views, uh, but we need to be able to be uh, civil towards one another, uh, have the ability to understand uh, different uh, points of views, and that really comes with building relationships uh, where you can see where that person uh, is coming from. And I think that that's something that we uh, have to do. Uh, obviously, it's not mandatory, but I think it's something that we have to do because uh, we, be, we will be a better body um, when we are able to come together. Now this question is going to take us down the line. Is it the job of the speaker to be a foil to the mayor, as Gifford Miller often was, or as a partner, as Christine Quinn often was? That's a great question. I think that there has to be a balance between both sides of City Hall what we need when it comes to the relationship between the mayor and the speaker should be a partnership and a pushback. So as speaker, in having the relationship with the mayor, I would have that perfect balance between partnership and pushback. We are going to have to prioritize New Yorkers. We are right now facing something that we've never faced before. We're looking towards a post-pandemic New York. 
So the speaker and the mayor must have a collective vision together, not separate, but a collective vision for the greater good of the people of the city of New York. We are right now hurting. Our seniors are hurting. Our youth are hurting. Our residents are hurting. We've taken measures in the budget in the past and our budget has been slashed in places that are just immeas immeasurable and it's taken a toll on the city. It's taken a toll in healthcare and sanitation. Garbage piled up all over the city. We're looking at our schools with the remote learning, our children with a digital divide that has been spotlighted because of this horrible pandemic. We're going to have to have a speaker that understands the intricacies of all of these avenues and somebody that's going to be able to partner with the mayor and somebody that is going to be able to push back to the mayor when need be. And I am that leader. I've, I've been in all finance uh, arenas within the New York City Council and a million trillion co committees in leadership and member and co-chair of the Black Latino Nation Caucus, the largest caucus in the entire New York City Council. Thank you. So I agree, I agree with uh, Council Member Adrian Adams that it's a, it's a balance, right? Um, I have a, a good relationship with, you know, uh, Mayor de Blasio now, but, you know, it hasn't uh, stopped me from disagreeing with him from time to time. I try to do that respectfully, but I think that, that is as a member, I think as a speaker, it is important that it not just be a conversation between the mayor and the speaker, but that the speaker is a representative voice of the body, and that those conversations, right, those interests, and um, the agenda of the entire body uh, has to be uh, first and foremost in, in those conversations. I agree uh, with Councilman Brian. Uh, you need to be, you need to know when to be a check and when to, to, to be a partner. Ultimately, you're always going to be a partner because the city council is the co-local branch of government and how the city is run. But um, your job is to advance and protect and defend the, uh, the, the mission of the city council, what your members want to do. So ultimately, that is, is your number one job. Um, and, and having a united body is then how you can get things done in working with the mayor. But first and foremost, you're there to advance um, to the priorities of the council? Well, I guess I can tell you stories about Gifford Miller as the speaker, and I can tell you stories about Christine Quinn as speakers, because I was under both of them. Um, I would say that the challenge, for instance, in the Quinn Bloomberg was third term. That was about as challenging as it got, because uh, arms were twisted and people were um, literally sick in the bathroom because they couldn't make up their mind about that vote. I did no not vote for the third time, in case you can't shake your head. But I say that because um, those were really tough times, and I would hope we never get to those kinds of points. That the way I hope um, to, to lead is that you work with a strong body where the body is really feeling positive about what the leadership is and what they're doing. And one way that hasn't been brought up, because as borough president, I can see that uh, the boroughs could be stronger. So I know we heard uh, about Staten Island, but all the boroughs are different. And so how could you strengthen the, bor strengthen the boroughs so that they feel that what they do together could also be a check in a positive way, as well as a partner with the mayor. Not to mention the fact that we really, as a group, understand the budget. The budget hasn't, sometimes in the budget, there are similar items to uh, Peter Malone being the uh, speaker. So how do you take a look at that budget that is really the way in which this city is guided and have a real discussion so that, that it's clear that the city council may have some different priorities, but ones that we can work on with the mayor. So the idea for me would be very strong membership that is comfortable and knowledgeable and thoroughly briefed on what their district needs and also how to get there. And, and that's what I'm good at. How do you get to this uh, challenge and solve it and find a way that it is good for the for New Yorkers. But I could tell you Miller and Quinn stories forever. Uh, look, I, I think you can never be uh, a rubber stamp uh, for the mayor. Uh, we share uh, the same values and issues, but this is a member-driven conference, and as speaker, uh, we have to be uh, the, a strong voice that represents the 51 members 
um, who have strong beliefs on what our agenda should be. Uh, if that conflicts uh, with the mayor, it is the responsibility of the speaker to stand up for the membership and ensure that we are passing the priorities uh, of that body. Uh, but it's also about how we build consensus uh, and find ways to work with this administration, uh, but never compromising the priorities of the 51 members of the New York City Council. I agree with everything you just said. Uh, look, we want to be a strong partner with the next administration, the next mayor, because we both, on both sides of City Hall, need each other. We pass legislation, we have to do a budget together. So um, there, but there will be moments when, as a council, we are going to have a different set of priorities, and we have to clearly articulate those. And just like Council Member White said, if we have a different opinion, then that's the consensus of the body, and then we will have our own voice in this process. And I think one of the things that the council can do more of is really, uh, in the budget process, they will clearly articulate our shared priorities and speak with one voice around what we would like to see accomplished in the budget process and start that process early. So the members can have a lot of you know, meaningful input into that. And whether you're on BNT or not BNT, in BNT, you have a voice, and a strong voice, in making sure that you are speaking for the priorities of your community and that the BNT and the speaker then can go and organize those priorities and speak for you. So, um, you know, I I'm excited about a lot of the new members coming, and I'm also excited of having new energy on the other side of City Hall, too, and I think it's an exciting moment, but I think it's going to be uh, always a balancing act about what our priorities are and where we partner, um, but I think that's why you have to be somebody who can be a consensus builder, and you have to be somebody who can organize and articulate the uh, priorities of the various and diverse uh, members of the City Council. I think it's a false choice. I don't think it should be, I disagree with the premise that it should be either or. I think you have to have a very healthy uh, relationship where there is exceptional room for debate. Whether I'm Eric Adams' favorite candidate or not, you have to be an independent person and you have to make sure that you are operating in a way that looks out for your members and the people of New York City first and foremost. And we should absolutely not be a rubber stamp. That is just counterintuitive, it's counterproductive. We have a charter mandated responsibility of oversight and investigation. That is what we are supposed to do and that it especially goes for the agencies uh, related to the mayor's uh, management. So I, I am also excited. I think people want to improve the city. I think we're gonna be living with this pandemic for a very long time and we have to lead a just recovery. So we need to make sure that the mayor is successful. No one benefits from a mayor that is not. But we also have to make sure that we are that independent, proactive, results-driven body. So this is, this is a question for uh, uh, Council Member Ayala. Um, you were the deputy chief of staff to the only city council speaker who didn't lose a citywide primary, uh, if my memory is correct. Council Member Melissa Block of the Burrito. What would you do differently than what she did? And how, what she was, what would be different yeah. about your approach to being speaker than Melissa's approach? I wish that I could answer that question. Um, but to be frank, when I was a deputy chief of staff, I was a deputy chief of staff. I was working my district. I was making sure that services were being rendered. I was making sure that people were housed. I was dealing with a displacement. I was dealing with um, you know, food insecurity issues, and so the last thing that I was paying attention to was uh, the speaker's, uh, you know, leadership style. Uh, as a member, as a person that worked with this, the, with Melissa for close to 15 years, you know, she was always very driven, uh, good on the issues, uh, and I appreciated her honesty. I think many of you know Melissa. You know, has like my mother says, no hair in her tongue. She says it like she sees it. Uh, and I appreciate that because at least I, you know, you, you always know where she's, you know, where she's coming from, and I think that that's something that I try to, you know, to, to bring into um, my relationships with, uh, with my colleagues and, and it, you know, with, with all of you, right? I think that for many of you that know me, um, I try to be uh, an honest broker, uh, always at the table, and um, if I don't, if you know, if I don't have the solutions, which sometimes I do not. Um, I will figure out right where to get those, and we will do that uh, in partnership. But um, quite frankly, you know, I wish that I could answer that question. I think that's a question that maybe you know a, a 
member that certainly had the pleasure of serving with Melissa uh, could best respond to, but I was really busy doing the work with the people. Thank you, Council Member Ayala. And at this time, Council Member Moya, this is just going to attend to a family matter. Thank you for joining us, sir. I would tell you my favorite constituent. Oh, hello. <laughs> I thought maybe now was a good time to bring that up. Gotcha. You yourself were a chief of staff to a council member. Can you please share how that experience informed you as a council member and how you would move around your district and city hall? Before I was a chief of staff, I had a full head of hair. Um, no, I mean, being a chief of staff really. Um, I think staffers make better elected officials, um, just because you know, you know as an elected official you're only as good as your staff. You're only as good as your newest staffer, uh, because staffers are really the ones that, that, that make the magic happen. Um, but I think it makes you a better elected official having been a staffer, um, not only because you know the sacrifice you have to make, the hours you put in, um, the amount of glory that your boss gets versus the work that you actually do. Uh, it, I think it just makes you a better um, elected official in respecting your staff and understanding that you're not going to be able to do your job without uh, a staff that, that sticks up for you, that's willing to sacrifice for you. Um, so I, I guess being the chief of staff has just reminded me, what, then when I finally got elected, it just has made me more humble in the work and, and more um, respectful of the amount of time and sacrifice that staffers really put into helping you do the work. So um, I try to treat my staff like gold and pay them as much money as I possibly can um, because it's not, it's not easy work. You know. So this is for Council Member uh, uh, Adams, and we're almost finished with just a couple of wrap-up questions in a minute, but for Council Member Adams, you represent a district that's about as far away from City Hall as, as it gets. It tends to be a, a, low, a lower rise district. Um, it, the, the central business in Jamaica is a relatively small central business district. So for your colleagues to come for a really built up dense areas, Councilmember Rivera's district couldn't be more different than, than yours. What would you say to, to, to the council members who have just a whole multitude of, of, of problems that you don't have just because of, of how, their, how their districts serve as central business districts. Oh, I'd love to invert that question uh, because there are council members that don't have the issues that the outer boroughs have. So um, as, as speaker, I think that we need to promote the interests of the outer boroughs, which is something that we have not seen very often from the speaker um, of the New York City Council. So as the speaker, a woman of color, who understands nuances in a different way and governs very, very differently than others govern, I would come in as speaker with the thoughtfulness of the majority of incoming members' districts. Districts that I've gone to, districts that I've visited and understand because their issues are my issues. Their pain is my pain. And that's something that I don't think that we've had a sensitivity level um, by a speaker that has typically been Manhattan-centric. It shows. It shows in the funding that's given across the board. It shows in the funding that's given at the table at the BNT that I sit on. It shows in the discretionary funding that's allotted to each council member. It shows even an attitude of governance when it comes to equity for everybody that is represented by 51 members of the New York City Council. So I had to invert that question, Ken, I hope you don't mind, because the outer boroughs have been neglected by the speaker for far too long. And as speaker, I will change that. Things will change radically, quickly, and drastically for the outer boroughs that I intend to support, as I will support all boroughs but focus that has never been given to the outer boroughs will be given with me as the speaker of the New York City Council. Wow. All right, so this is the last question. Um, this is going to run down the line as well. Councilmember Rivera, we're gonna begin with you. 
I'm changing this question, Ken, because I don't want to get in so much trouble. The original <laughs> question was, if you are not running for speaker, who would you vote for and why? I'm switching it to which characteristic from one of your colleagues would you want to bring to the role of speaker? So which one do you admire the which characteristic of one of your colleagues do you admire the most that you would bring into the speaker role? Is that safe? That's the <laughs> You're all just so wonderful. <laughs> I mean, to do this work, it's not all glamour, let me tell you. Uh, I take pictures of garbage cans that are overflowing. It's, it's great. Um, I think, I mean, every, I think, well, let me just, I'm gonna talk about myself. <laughs> so I have my own style, all right? I have a style that is very different from every single person at this table. Um, and I think that what I can bring as someone who is focused on public health, as a proud Puerto Rican woman who grew up in subsidized housing, as someone who is a native New Yorker, I can't wait uh, to lead this body and be as helpful and supportive as possible. I will tell you that I think there's a, a few of my colleagues who, who take this job very, very seriously, and I respect that tremendously. There is uh, you got to be a little scrappy to do this work. It's like jazz. There has to be improv and there has to be choreography. But you also have to bring a level of sophistication to this role because this is New York City. And people are watching every single day. And we have 35,000 people that have died. Small businesses are a wreck. Midtown is just coming back to life. And we have to make sure that black and brown communities don't fall any further behind. So you have to take this job very seriously. This is not a game, sports analogies aside, and you have to make sure um, that you're working with everyone. So I respect the, the level of commitment from each person at this table because this is not an easy thing to do. Um, and I wish everyone the best. Uh, well, I like Gail's stories about Gifford Miller and Christine Quinn. I mean, I think, uh, no, kidding aside, I mean, I, I'm not, I, I want to share like, what Carlina said about this. This is a very, difficult and hard process, but the really rewarding part of it is we got to knock doors and with a lot of the new candidates here, we got to meet and all of our new colleagues and we got to hear their ideas and I think there is a tremendous amount of energy and new ideas that are coming into the council. I think it's a very exciting moment, no offense to anyone who's leaving, I can handle it. Uh, no, but I, I think it's a really exciting moment in the city and it'd be, it's a big opportunity and I think we all together can't waste this opportunity, especially at one of the most important moments in the city's history. And so uh, having gotten to know a lot of candidates uh, over the last year or two years, I'm excited about what they're gonna bring and what I admire with people on the stage is that they put their name forward to be a leader in the city during a very, very challenging moment. And we all do have our different styles and quirks and ways that we might be a speaker, but I think everyone on here is capable of doing the job. I think they'll do it well. And if it's on me, I'm very much looking forward to helping and working alongside whoever it is because we need that kind of collaborative attitude right now in the city. And uh, we need all of us, 51, no matter where you live, no matter what your like, party label is, what it is, this is a serious job. You have to do really hard stuff in this job, and you need the support of all your colleagues to get to work together. So I just, I will say kind of what uh, Councilman Rivera said, which is I admire everyone for being up here because it's, it's not an easy process, but it's a rewarding process one way or the other. And I think uh, it's, it's exciting to see people put out their ideas for what the council can be doing and how to address the challenges of the city right now. I certainly want to echo the, the people who are running for speaker and the people who ran and won as council members are extraordinary. Um, I think I've met with most of the new members and the fact that they have uh, participated in legal aid, participated as organizers, um, figured out how to change a project that wasn't going in the right direction, and the list is endless and impressive. And so um, we need to build on that. It's a, a group of people who are, yes, diverse, not only ethnically and obviously many women, but wow, are they uh, impressive in terms of their backgrounds and what they've accomplished in the past. Former members of the assembly, it's, it's uh, phenomenal. So the question is, how do you take all of this and make the city a better place? And one of the ways it is, um, I think that we can uh, have to focus is this land use. I've done 200 ULERPs. Um, you heard about some of the challenges that um, they present. And um, I think the other issue is how do you take this, the mayor said the budget is now $102 billion. That's bigger than everything but uh, New York, California, and the United States. That's a big budget. 
Is that the right budget? What's going to happen in Washington? Are we going to end up with less money? Uh, what's the peg look like? All of those issues, this group here is fully capable of handling and being a leader on. Um, and I think with obviously input from amazing members. So what I'm saying to answer your question is, you need every aspect of every talent to make this city council partner with the mayor and make the changes that we need. People say, well, what are your three priorities? There are so many priorities. There are so, so they're interconnected. Workforce is interconnected with education, with obviously um, figuring out how to have better uh, city services, quality of life. It's all interconnected. And so the talent that's here and the talent that comes with the new members is what is absolutely fully uh, part of the agenda in order to make changes. So I, I think what I, what I want to say is there isn't one aspect of a uh, person's personality or assets. It all has to fit together because the problems, in my opinion, I've obviously been around for a long time, you know that. These are challenges that need to be surmounted, but it's not going to be easy. I would say um, everyone brings something different to, to the race. Everyone brings a different style, to, especially Diana. Um, uh, everyone brings a different style, a different sincerity, a different approach. Um, and I think that's why you, you'll see, um, however this, this ends up shaking out, um, that, that um, you know, you'll see this leadership structure that will include um, leveraging those different lived experiences and leveraging those different uh, talents. Um, it's such a diverse body coming in, people from just all different uh, walks of life and experiences, and that's really what the council is all about. Uh, for the role of the speaker, it's how do you synthesize all of those different um, priorities um, to advance uh, the, the agenda of the body, uh, but, but the city council is scrappy by design. We represent 51 very unique districts, um, and, um, and I think that's what's so magical about it, and that, that's what makes the body stronger as a sum of all its parts, is because it, there's 51 different, different flavors and 51 different approaches um, that we all come together to, to make the city a better place. So it's exciting to see uh, so many different uh, dynamic folks stepping up. It was such a simple question. <laughs> this is what we don't do, guys. The political response is like forever and ever. I'm joking, I'm joking. Um, but I think, listen, I'm gonna answer the question the way that it was asked. I would like to be, and continue to be, because I think I'm a little bit of this, as funky and as badass as Carlina Rivera is. Um, as honest, um, as such a, I mean, I cannot tell you how great of a human being Keith is. Whenever I am, you know, unsure of something or, you know, looking for someone that has a little bit of common sense, like I call Keith. He's one of my go-to people. He's my top, one of uh, my, definitely on my top five. Uh, Gail, oh my God, like, Gail knows everything. Like, <laughs> there, is a, there is not a subject on the face of this earth that you cannot ask Gail about and she will not have a response. Like, she is just, a, you know, I call her the perpetual student. She's always studying, she's always learning, um, and she's been a wonderful uh, colleague to me uh, and also, you know, a source of inspiration. I truly admire her. Justin is my baby boo. Um, you know, I, I, you know and, and I think this is very unpopular of me to say all of these things, right? Because we're in a competition together and I think right, I, we all want your vote uh, and your support. But I think that you know, we have a very unique situation here where we all genuinely love each other. And we have a really good relationship. And I, I don't think that you're gonna find, or you shouldn't be finding you know, opportunities where we're gonna be ripping each other apart because we really do our, you know, work really hard to maintain those relationships. Uh, the women a little bit more than the men because we do a lot of other extracurricular activities. But I digress, I digress. Justin, Justin is you know, one of the smartest, uh, kindest individuals uh, that I know and um, you know, on many times, right? Because this is a very difficult job and we make many sacrifices and, um, and I've gone through my share of challenges and he's always been there and sometimes I haven't even had to call, like he's been the first to call. Last year when I had COVID, he was the only one, by the way, that sent me a gift. He sent me a food basket. He sent me a food basket. I remember that. I remember that, Justin. And I still love you all. I did send him. It was funded by everyone. It was funded by everyone. 
I, I, I did send pictures to my colleagues to, you know, so that they, they understand, like, this is how you should be treating your colleagues. And, and, Adrian, and Adrian is just like, you know, I mean, she's just, she's very structured, she's very strict, she's very, you know, she's very much focused on, you know, on the issues. Um, but she's also, she, you're a pro, you're a pro, you know? Um, she is, uh, she's kind, um, she's gentle, and um, very collegial, and I would, you know, all of these traits and all of these colleagues, I try to bring with me every single day. I am very fortunate to call on my colleagues. She just answer, you know. really, really, you know, encapsulated everything, and she answered the question the way that it was asked. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's the lesson of the day, and I'm not going to top that by going down the line, because I think that my colleagues know we all have individual relationships for such a long time. Um, we've been colleagues for four years, and we've all had independent, fantastic relationships one-on-one. -on -one. And that is genuine. And even Gail, as uh, Manhattan Borough President, the ultimate respect, and I've always told you this, the ultimate respect that I have for you is just beyond, beyond. Thank you. So I will say that they know how I feel about them. And it takes a lot of heart to do this work. So for our incoming colleagues, you've got what it takes because your districts elected you to speak for them. This job is not for the faint of heart, but you did that. And I'm gonna drop the mic for you right now. You did that. Thank you. Thank you, council members, council member elect, the new council members who are with us uh, today. If, if you thought that by coming here, it was gonna make your decision easier uh, coming in January, I don't, I don't see how, how that possibly could be the, the case. And so I wish you all the best of luck in your tenure. Wish you the best of luck with this. It would be the first hard decision that you're going to have to, uh, to make. And, and to our panelists and, and the speaker contenders who I really admire for, for your willingness to put yourselves out of that position and to participate in what is a, probably the most open process for selecting a speaker that, that I can work well. Um, I just want to say two things to you. One is that um, whichever one of you becomes the, the first among equals, um, you should know how fortunate you are that you'll have the other members who are up here today as, as part of your leadership team and, and, and available. And I can tell you as a, as a lifelong New York City resident um, that I, the confidence that I have next uh, council. And then I just want to say uh, what I consider to be also a very important piece of advice. Make sure you're nice to former council members because you're going to be one someday. Thank you all for coming.